Hello, Ambus. Uh, I'm going to share with you a, a quick little story that illustrates uh, something that's very important to know about modeling. Our uh, assumption is, sometimes erroneously, that the way you build models, for example, regression models, is you dump tons of data into a computer and you punch a button and Eureka, a miracle happens, and you get the model that is going to be very helpful. In actuality, it begins with subject matter expertise and understanding the relationships among the data. And then you use the data analysis to confirm and quantify your subject matter expertise. That's one very important idea. The other important idea is something we call the principle of parsimony. And that basically says there's lots of different models that would explain the data that you have, but the one you want to choose is the one that is the most simple. So we're going to be talking about two things, or illustrating two things. One is the importance of understanding the situation that you're modeling, or the importance of subject matter expertise. For example, when we were modeling the prices of houses, we had enough subject matter expertise. We chose a very simple and straightforward subject. And our subject matter expertise would tell us that as the square foot of the house increased, the price of the house would increase. Uh, in other situations, that's not necessarily true. So you may have to do a, a whole lot of listening and a whole lot of studying before you actually are ready to start analyzing data. The second thing is the principle of parsimony. It might say we could have a single variable regression that explains 50% of the variation or 50% of the variance, and we could have a multiple regression that's got 10 variables in it, and it explains let's say 60% of the variation. Well, probably the first model is going to be much more useful to you than the second, and we'll, we'll understand that better as we move along through this. Here's a story from World War II. The uh, British uh, aircraft bombers would come back from their mission, and uh, they might look a little bit like this picture here. They would have bullet holes through them, and uh, so the, they decided it might be good to put some armor on the aircraft to protect the areas that got hit the most with bullets. Obviously, you couldn't armor the entire aircraft. Uh, an, an aircraft with armor uh, all over it would be called a tank. I don't think it would fly very well. So uh, they started collecting data on where the aircraft were getting hit the most in order to decide where they might be able to put some armor. And here's what the aggregated data look like. And uh, you can see that the, the you know, this, this is probably collected over many planes and they totaled the number of bullet holes. And then they divided by the square foot of different areas of the aircraft to get uh, uh, a frequency. So this, this shows what those frequencies of hits per square foot or in different areas of the aircraft. So, you know, you could start thinking about the data and maybe you could put some sort of uh, uh, geometric coordinates uh, over the body of the aircraft and develop a regression model, or you could, there's lots of other kinds of models that you could use to fit the data and come up with a prediction of the areas of the aircraft that will get hit the most in order to know where to put the protective armor. And you could do visual analysis of the data. You could create a drawing like this, and this would be a composite of all aircraft, and each bullet hole marked on this drawing represents a bullet hole that occurred somewhere on one of your aircraft. And you could look at uh, this, and maybe that would give you some insights in helping you analyze your data. So they gave the data to a mathematician by the name of Abraham Wald. And Abraham Wald had something that Ellie Goldratt says is very uncommon, that is common sense. 
So rather than uh, just taking their data and crunching the numbers and coming back with a formula or maybe a recommendation, uh, Wald decided, well, are they really asking the right question here? And his uh, experience in working with data and his mathematical background told him that when you're trying to explain some kind of physical phenomenon, the more simple the story is, the more likely it is to be correct. So uh, he started from these two uh, perspectives in, in looking at the data. So Wall's reasoning probably went something like this. Certainly, if, if I had to model the distribution of the bullet holes and I had to say what is the most simple model that I could come up with, I could just say, well, it's uniformly distributed over the entire aircraft or maybe the portion of the aircraft that's exposed to, to bullet fire, maybe the bottom and the sides of the aircraft, I don't know. And you, you might say, well, does that match reality? Well, it would kind of assume that, uh, you know, the bullets are flying, the anti-aircraft fire is not very accurate, the, uh, uh, so the plane's equally likely to take any square foot on the plane and it's equally likely to get hit. So you'd, you'd say, yeah, that story kind of makes sense, but it, it doesn't fit the data that we have, so we're going to have to discard it. Well, Wald didn't stop there. So if you have already figured it out and you're sitting there at your computer yelling and calling me an idiot, you're probably in good company in calling me an idiot, but you're in extremely rare company in figuring it out because Wald was the only person at the time that realized what was actually going on. Here's what was going on. The aircraft that came back did have an ununiform distribution of bullet holes. But if you take the fraction of aircraft that we weren't able to count, those that didn't come back, and added the, assumed that those were the ones that got hit more where the aircraft that did come back got hit less, then and added all that up, it all made sense. The, the data all fit Wald's basic model of uniform distribution. And not only did it explain the data, it also said we're asking the wrong question of the data because the areas that have the fewest bullet holes represent the areas that had the most bullet holes on those aircraft that didn't come back. Those are the areas that need to be protected. So what Wall really saw was you have to come up with a very convoluted story to explain why one area of the aircraft would have a lot of bullet holes and an area that's right by it would have a lot fewer bullet holes. And so he, he backed up and he said, we, there's got to be a more simple explanation. And the explanation simply was, we're looking at a censored set of data. The data was censored by the fact that some of the aircraft didn't make it back. And notice that the conclusion is exactly the opposite of the way the problem was framed originally. 